Hi everyone, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and we're back with something special today. Star Trek Voyager to Lose the Earth. Uh, so this is the first Star Trek Voyager novel that I've been able to read, and I probably should have did a little bit of research before I read it, because this is actually the kind of the conclusion of the whole Star Trek Voyager relaunch series, which I didn't really realize when I first got it. I just bought it at the time. It was a new release. Uh, this was actually released, I think... Yeah, back in 2020 here, I think it says. So, um, I picked it up back then, and uh, so I just wanted a Voyager novel to read, and had knew of the author's work through the work that she did in Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery. But I didn't do enough research to know that she'd actually written several more Voyager novels before this, and this is like the conclusion to that series. Uh but that being said, even that being like the, the end part of a series, it was still a really fun read. So let's kind of dive right in with the normal. <clears throat> uh, this is Star Trek Voyager to Lose the Earth by New York Times best-selling author Kirsten Beyer, co-creator of Star Trek Picard. <clears throat> Lost, the USS Galen, part of the Full Circle Fleet that is also includes the Voyager, Vesta, and the Demeter, has vanished in the vast expanse of the Delta Quadrant, with all hands on board, including Lieutenant Harry Kim, missing in action. But even as Full Circle works to determine the fate of the Galen, a struggle for survival begins at the far end of the galaxy. New revelations about Species 001, the race that constructed the biodomes that first grew the fleet to investigate planet DK-1116, force Admiral Catherine Janeway to risk everything to learn the truth. So, jumping right in, I guess, as, first, as soon as I started reading the book, I realized that I was jumping into part of a much larger story. Uh, so the story actually picks up where they are at this planet, this very special planet, DK-116, um, which I guess is explored much more in the novel that comes right before this, which is called Architects of Infinity. So I think I definitely do want to check that out at some point. But this novel in itself did stand up, even without knowing any of the past of what was going on with the Full Circle Fleet. Uh, they kind of covered enough in the beginning where you know what's going on with it, and, and you're able just to jump right in and enjoy the story. So the story picks off with them uh, activating basically this planet, which sends the star flying through space, and then the ship is summoned and this ship is uh, called the Edra Edramaya, and I hope I'm saying that right. I kept calling them Ephedra in my head. Edramaya. Uh, now, the Edramaya comes in, and they do what they believe it is attack the USS Galen, and it's blown up with all hands lost. Uh, but it turns out it's just been moved. So the story begins on the USS Galen with Harry Kim waking up, and basically they have this crew which has been... Uh, decimated by this this move and their ship is nearly destroyed and they're just kind of in the situation where they've got to do everything they can to survive for the next minute for the next minute for the next minute and they're kind of jumping right into that and then throwing in these little plot details from the previous books uh, which I won't actually get into too much here with that because it goes off into so many different directions which is really them just kind of tying up these loose ends from these previous novels. And I'll kind of stick with more of what the, the main story going on here is. Which for me, which is kind of the most interesting part of this, was this kind of lost ship idea. And they're out there struggling, they got to get everything going, get things back together, and, and get it, you know, get them going. Which is kind of one of the reasons why I like Voyager so much. You know, this lost ship out on their own, uh, doing whatever they can to survive and get themselves home. Uh, so that's how this starts. And then it kind of jumps back and forth between the Galen and then the rest of the Full Circle fleet. Now, the rest of the fleet right now consists of three other ships, which is the Vesta, uh, the Demeter, and, of course, of course, Voyager. Now, Voyager is now captained by Captain Chakotay, and uh, Janeway has moved up to being an admiral. So a lot has happened in the lit verse between the end of Voyager and what I'm reading now. And I'm not even going to try to get into all that or learn about all that. That's a, you know, something to read for another day. Uh, but for now, that's kind of where we're at. Captain Chakotay on the Voyager. Uh, USS Vesta is captained by a Captain Farkas. And then they have a uh, 
a strange team of like double captains uh, on this USS Demeter, this Liam O'Donnell, and uh, he is has a co-captain who was with him, and I guess it was probably something that kind of they explained more in these other books too. And that was one of the things about this is you just kind of had to accept that, yeah, there's things that they're going to talk about that you're not going to know about. Those happened previously, and that's fine. Uh, she carries the story along well enough where it kind of glosses over these past things and you're able just to keep enjoying the ride. Uh, so a few of the main things that they're touching on here <clears throat> is that there is, uh, from a previous, uh, one of the previous stories, there's this Ensign Gwyn, and she is a Creosian. Now, if you remember Creosians, there was a single episode of TNG uh, where a Creosian was uh, brought aboard, and they are like empathic metamorphs, and they imprint upon someone and turn themselves into their perfect mate. Now, through some kind of accident in a previous novel, this Gwyn has uh, was forced to basically imprint upon Harry Kim's unborn child. Uh, so she's dealing with the issues from that, but through her connection with that, she's able to let the rest of the fleet know that the ship wasn't destroyed, and in fact it is just lost somewhere. So that kind of sets the whole rest of the fleet off into everything they can do to figure out what happened and what they have to do to you know, find out what happened to the Galen. So they review the footage, they do prove that it was not destroyed, but actually transported somewhere away. So that kind of gives them like a place to start. So they go back to some more story on the Galen, and then, um, now Kim was kind of in temporary command taking things over. Uh, he was just over on the ship with his, uh, I guess his fiance, who was this uh, uh, Lieutenant Conlon, and uh, she was the father of his child. So he was on that ship just kind of checking in on them when this accident happened, and he's actually now the security officer on the Voyager. Uh, but now the the captain who is incapacitated during the move, she wakes up, and uh, there's actually something going on with Conlon, and her body has been deteriorating over time, and they have one way to save her and thus keep her, you know, she's the main engineer as well, kind of the one keeping the whole ship running, and they decide that the only way they can save her is to transfer her body into her, her consciousness into a hologram. So they're able to do this because this ship, the USS Galen, is kind of a specifically designed hologram ship, designed to have multiple emitters and basically operate with maybe like a 50% holographic crew. So they do decide they're going to work on one solution is transferring her into this holographic body to, to save her life. So this book goes off in a lot of different directions. So they're in the full circle fleet. They're basically trying to figure out how can they contact this species again? How can they get their attention so that they can find out where their ship is at? So they kind of go back and forth between... Uh, the, the, the fleet there on the other side of space figuring out a way to contact them and then back on the Galen they're working to get everything back in order and uh, <clears throat> one of the fun things about what goes on on there is that they do have <clears throat> this cool scene they have to go out and they have to fix their communications array and in the process of doing it they seem to kind of get noticed by the aliens, who so far have kind of left them undisturbed. They transported them there, but left them undisturbed. So they had this scene where they, uh, this character, uh, who I didn't know before, Ransom Velf, who goes out in an EV suit to fix the communications things, and uh, he gets everything done, and he's on his way back, but when he's on his way back, they notice that there's five of these aliens right behind him. So they're kind of like creepily getting slower, you know, they're getting, they're getting faster and faster and faster towards him, and they try to reel them in faster and faster, but they just can't get them fast enough, and these five creatures get to him, and they pull him away, and um, there was damage to his suit, so they believe, basically, he's a loss, and that he's been taken by them, and he's dead. Now, back on the, on the ship, they're trying to still continue to figure out how they can communicate, and they're trying to work through, also, all this different kind of emotional trauma that they're dealing with while being, being lost, uh, so Nancy Conlon, she uh, <clears throat> she uh, gives Harry a clarinet. Now Clary loves playing clarinet, and this is going to come in very important later in the story. So don't don't forget about that. Uh, but in the process of uh, doing that, her body is deteriorated more and more and more, and now she's even blind. 
and she does have to go forward with the process to put herself into the body, the, the, the holographic body. So, that's happening. So, now they have another mission as well. So, I guess one of the things about this book that did kind of bother me is that it is going off in a lot of different directions. And I feel like maybe they could have cut out like one or two of the stories to kind of thin, thin things out. You know, maybe you just have the USS Galen, and then you have their rescue operation. But then you also have some other things thrown in. So they have this uh, kind of obsessive Commander O'Donnell, who's one of the commanders of the Demeter, and he is obsessed with this Edromaya substance. So he's convinced them that in the, means, in the middle of all this, they're going to try to lead a mission there to contain some of it so they can study it further and learn more about the secrets of it, you know, what all it can do. So they are on an away mission to see what they can do to kind of actually get a hold of some of it and bring it back to the ship. Um, in the meantime, they do manage to figure out how they can save uh, Nancy Conlon. So if they do get back together, uh, a couple of the doctors in the full circle fleet have kind of discovered what they can do. Uh, back on the Galen, Ensign Velt is brought back. Uh, one of the ensigns of the Galen has actually kind of managed to learn to start communicating with them as well. So they're establishing uh, communication, but when Velt is brought back, he is not himself. And one of the first things he does when he wakes up is actually just reach into it like a power conduit and grab a hold of it and try to suck the power. So they sedate him, but they do eventually figure out that he was sent there to be the translator for these Edramites. So now at this point, they've kind of got everything where they can just lay out the whole mystery for you. And uh, it actually turned out to be a very interesting idea, I guess, with what these aliens were trying to do. And the, the whole thing kind of breaks down in like the 19th and 20th chapter of the book, where they just explain that they are kind of explorers of a different kind. And they are trying to break through the Great Galactic Barri Barrier. But so far, they've tried many different things, and they have no way of doing it. Uh, as soon as uh, Voyager and the fleet came into view, and their ships were scanned, they had realized that they had this quantum stream drive, which could help them break through the barrier. So the whole point in them taking the Galen and everything in the book was just to help them explore more, and how they could get through the barrier. Now, what they wanted to do was they were going to basically force them to do it. Force the Galen to open the slipstream corridor and help them break the Great Barrier and get through. This, of course, would mean that the crew of the Galen would have to follow them through and that they would be, you know, lost in that other galaxy for who knows how long. But the other option that they leave them is that they would transform them to be able to survive the vacuum of space and then just take their ship and do it anyway <laughs> and leave them there kind of floating around in space doing whatever. Uh, neither option is really very satisfying to anyone, really, of course. Uh, but they do manage to come to a satisfying conclusion in a very strange way. So, uh, around like the end of it, things get kind of sad for Ensign Kim. And he's there, excuse me, and he's playing his clarinet for his unborn daughter. And he's playing uh, Claire de Lune. And during the time he's playing this, uh, Ransom Velth, who's kind of being the translator for these Edra Meyer, he's uh, working on getting things complete so they can get the Galen to open up this slipstream. And he hears this music. And this is what basically changes this species kind of like whole idea of how they can do this. Uh, for them, I guess music was something that they didn't understand and that they couldn't create. So there are species that's like advanced and ahead of us in so many different ways and looks at things in such a different way. But music was the thing that was able to, I guess it made them see our species as something more, as also being builders, you know, like how they saw themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the end, Harry Kim and his clarinet kind of saved the day uh, now, going back to the Full Circle Fleet, they did manage to, uh, through uh, a couple of the side characters that they, uh, I won't get into too much, they did manage to basically create this device that would allow them to locate the exact position of the Edramaya and the Galen. 
So they do do that, and then while all this is going on, and Harry's playing his clarinet, and things are kind of coming to a close there on the Galen, the whole fleet kind of comes in on the slipstream drive, so everything, in the end, can just wrap itself right up into a nice little bow. You know, which I like. You know, we don't want any quantum entanglement, nothing weird. Let's just get it wrapped up into a satisfying conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion, I think... So the whole book, like I said, it was kind of weird. I, it was off in a few different directions. I felt maybe a little bit lost because it was talking a lot about characters that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, things that happened in other books. But it wrapped itself up so satisfyingly for me. And I just really think that in the end, it left me wanting to see more of this. Whether that's going back and reading from the beginning of the relaunch, or maybe just the beginning of when Kirsten Byer started writing these. I'm definitely interested in finding out more about these characters now, even kind of knowing how things end up for them in the end. So, a uh, couple of interesting notes from the end of the book uh, that I will say. Uh, <clears throat> really, I think probably one of the best parts about it was how the whole thing ended up. So, they decide, <clears throat> the Edramaya decide that, of course, they after seeing who they really are and like learning what they can create, they decide they don't want to force them to open that quantum slipstream drive. Uh, but of course, Starfleet and you know they still want to help them themselves, and it's decided that Voyager will be the one to do it. So Voyager gets to go on another amazing journey, and, and that's kind of how this whole thing ends. It actually ends with Chakotay and Janeway getting married, if you can believe that. I guess they have a whole romance that happens in the relaunch novels. But that's just right at the very end. But the real cool part about the end of this book is just the idea of Voyager setting off on this whole other adventure. And like completely another adventure. Through the galactic barrier into another galaxy. Uh, so that I think was one of the coolest parts about this. And it made me want to see, made me want to see that adventure, you know? what happens to them when they go through that barrier. <coughs> Excuse me. Because they don't cover anything like that here. Basically, the book ends with them getting ready to pr work with the Edramaya to get ready to go on their mission through the barrier. So, wow. Uh, I started this book on the 11th, and I was able to finish it just today. So it took me just about a little over two weeks to do it. Uh, really fun book. Uh, if you're a fan of Voyager, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, if you're a fan of Picard and Discovery, uh, Kirsten Beyer has been a writer and a producer for both of those shows, and that's actually what drew me to the book in the first place. Uh, a couple fun things I will point out is, I don't know if she was a writer for the fourth season of Discovery, but... I drew a lot of connections between this book and the Edramaya and Species 10C and the final episode or the final uh, few episodes there of Discovery. A lot of things definitely were really, really closely in common. Uh, mainly being that both species communicated by these like these flashing lights. So I got I think maybe that was something that they kind of brought over an idea that they brought over for that, which I think was great because it's such a, a cool way. To have to think, how does another species who's like so different from us communicate? You know, so to have this whole different way to communicate is really cool, and also just the, the galactic barrier and stuff. So there was a lot of like correlation, I think, between the two, and I thought that was cool. So uh, in the end, Star Trek Voyager to Lucy Earth, very fun book. I still don't understand the title. I even looked up to see if I could figure it out. I didn't look too closely, but they don't reference to lose the Earth <coughs> Excuse me, in the book at all. So if anyone knows, let me know. I don't know where that title came from, but it was a good book nonetheless. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we're going to be moving back to some classic, classic, classic stuff next time. And we'll be reading Star Trek Time for Yesterday, I think, next. So... Uh, stay tuned for that, and as always, live long and prosper, and we'll see you next time. Bye.